good morning. Welcome to RC. We're glad that you're with us today. If I could call your attention to our bulletins this morning very quickly, I uh, want to highlight two very quick announcements for you, and then we'll get ourselves going uh, this morning. Uh, the first one is Daytona Beach. If you have a young one in your family, a teenager, middle schooler, please see Ricky, our youth pastor, after service. Uh, the kids are heading out to this massive, like, 9,000 youth uh, conference up in Daytona, and it's always an amazing time. Uh, really impacts them uh, in a profound, profound way. A lot of our young folks have become Christians. In fact, Ricky became a Christian uh, there as well. Next week, please make a note of this. I'll say it at the end of the service as well. Uh, 11 a.m. service. It's going to be a united service. We're going to worship together uh, with our Spanish side. We always do that over some of the big major holidays. Uh, we haven't confirmed if it's going to be a transition yet, but nonetheless, it was on the schedule to be united. So just make a note, please, 11 a.m. We'll put it on the newsletter. I'll announce it again at the end of the service, but just make a note. And if you see that someone's missing today, I know a lot of people are traveling at this point. Uh, please just, you know, shoot them a little text message or something. 11 o'clock in the morning next Sunday, United Worship. It's a really, really powerful and beautiful experience. Having said that, no more announcements. We'll say some more stuff at the end of the service. Why don't we stand up for a moment? Go ahead and take a quick walk around the room. Extend a hand of fellowship to someone. Welcome them this morning in the name of the Lord. Good to see you. Let me turn my mic off. Good morning, Redeemer. Let's stand to our feet. Worship our awesome God who is worthy of our praise. This dry and desert land, I tell myself, keep walking on. Here's something up ahead, water falling like a song. An everlasting stream, your river carries me home. Let it flow, let it flow. It goes like A well that never will run dry I've rambled on my own Never believing I would find An everlasting stream Your river carries me home Let it flow, let it flow
let's come before God who is in control and sing to him this morning. You hear me when I call, you are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Who shall I fear? You crush the enemy. sword and shield, though troubles linger still, whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me, I know who stands behind, the God of angel armies is always by my side, the one who reigns forever.
That's our God. Amen. We can clap to that. It's for him. It's not for us. It's for him. Amen. Praise his name. hope Jesus you are salvation it's in Christ alone in Christ alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my soul this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are still, when striving seems My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand oh.
Till he returns or calls me home Here in the power of Christ I'll stand Here in the power of Christ we stand Give him glory church In his power we stand church powerful God we thank you for Jesus Christ God that it would be in Christ alone that we find our satisfaction that it would be in Christ alone that we find salvation forgive us God when we go to other things to other people to try and fill us. It is only in Christ alone. God, we thank you for the promises that are in Jesus, for the hope that is in Jesus, that we are never alone, that we never need to fear, that we are forgiven, that we are loved. We thank you for Jesus. How beautiful those lyrics. That no one can pluck us from your hand. No scheme of man can pluck us from your hand. That when you have called us yours, that we will be yours. So God, I pray today that we would run to you, that we wouldn't hold back that nothing would hinder us from running and clinging to the cross of Jesus Christ. But we ask for forgiveness where it's needed. But we ask for strength where it's needed. But we ask for wisdom where it's needed. God, you are the provider of all. You are the Lord of all. Nothing is outside of your hands, even when we don't understand it. God, you are in control. And just because we don't see the path doesn't mean that you don't have a plan for us. So God, we trust you. And in the middle of the things that we don't understand, that's when our praise is the most effective because even when our feelings may tell us otherwise, our faith says, I will worship my God. I will worship him because I know he is good and I know his promises for me are good and I will worship him. So I pray that over our church, not just in this building, but as we go out, that we would worship our God and that the world would see us worship while we're waiting because we choose to worship a God who is great in the midst of it all. Spirit, rain down upon us. Speak to us in a way that only you can speak to us. Open our hearts. God, give us hearts of flesh when so often we have hearts of stone. We love you, God. We thank you for Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen, amen. You may be seated.
I'll give you three guesses as to what the first words out of my mouth this morning are going to be, but you only need one. Here we are. Again. When I was young and um, I did something wrong, which was a lot, uh, my father had a very good habit, which I was very afraid of. Uh, he would just say, we need to talk. And then I knew that we're going to have a serious conversation. It's going to be one of those. And so we need to talk. Morning. I'm going to go in and out of the message for today. Obviously, all of you are aware of the Supreme Court's uh, decision 5 to 4 about same-sex marriage. So I'm going to address that a little bit because I think that um, to simply gloss over it and continue in a sermon series just for the sake of a sermon series doesn't do you justice and I wouldn't be doing my job correctly. Let me, let me attack it from this angle. About four weeks ago, we are here at a training seminar for our kind of next generation leaders here at our church with all the transition going on, my father stepping down. Uh, I am taking it upon myself to try to raise up a whole new generation of leaders that will serve this church and serve it faithfully and serve it well, serve it according to God's word. Let's remember that. God's word. And so I'm talking with Michael. Is Michael here today? He might be traveling. And George Sr., who always sits here with Kelly in, in the front. They're, they'll be back next Sunday. They're in Tennessee enjoying their cabin. Um, George says, hey, Edwin, I've noticed that sometimes when some of these things happen out there, um, you don't really go at them head on. Why is that? He said, well, when the church that is born is only four years old. It's only four years old. It's still kind of a child to a certain ex extent. There are individuals here that have discovered Christ for the first time. There are individuals here who were in church for many, many years, and because they've been attending here, their eyes have been opened in a different way to understanding what Scripture says and to understanding what Christ has for them, what God has done, and it's almost like they're beginning again. There are several individuals, many in here, who've been in church, in and out, and kind of know their way around the Bible, know their way around some of the conversations. But again, there's a learning curve there. So my answer to George and to Michael was, well, it's rather simple. I have spent four years now uh, putting in a foundation. We have talked about the character of Christ, what he has done for us. We have tried to really clarify what gospel is, the good news of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. We have taken a look at the character of God, how he is to be feared in the sense that, yes, he can, what does Jesus say, destroy both body and soul, but he has to be feared in the sense of lifted up in incredible awe and revere because of who he is, because of the scope and magnitude of his person, and because he has decided in the second person of the Trinity to condescend, to step down and take on flesh, to become a man, to redeem us. That is amazing, and if that ever stops blowing your mind away, then you, it's time to stop coming to church, because that is the greatest news that you will ever hear. We have wrestled with the Holy Spirit and how He makes and breaks and molds and remolds and is to change us, and so we've been on this journey through basically the foundational pieces Word of God, why it's important, what is church, what is its function, these foundational pieces. And so my response to both of them was, hey, look, you know, we might need a little more foundation in there before we start tackling some of these things because you can't answer a question without the correct background. You can't offer a good response if you don't know the entirety of what you're supposed to know about the issue. But, but, society is racing at a pace that now we must kind of crank up our engines and get to. So some of you might not be ready for the conversation. Some of you might. But the conversation has to be had. And so the conversation begins today. Here is what we're going to do. We're not going to have the entire conversation today. I want to simply lay out some basic framework for you, for you to think through, process, digest, allow God to start to work there, and then, obviously, next week is United Service, July 4th weekend. People are in and out. We're going to be together with our Spanish service. On the other side of that, 
I am going to take a page out of Tim Keller, out of Redeemer in New York. And what he did when he first started his church is fascinating. Uh, he had a lot of people who were seeking Christ, trying to figure out who Jesus was, coming to his church. And what he discovered was that he needed to kind of unpack some of the things he would say on Sunday mornings. So what we will do on July 12th, okay, so if you want to mark down your calendars, just make sure you don't miss church that day, is that I'm going to address what marriage is. What does Scripture say it is? What does God expect from it? And why did he give it to us in the first place? Okay? And, and it's funny, you're going to realize that the conversation has really almost nothing to do with same-sex marriage, but it has everything to do with this vehicle and this covenant that God has given us to see something of eternity. Okay? Don't allow the noise out there to muddle what God has put in here. That'll be July 12th. After I preach that message, uh, we'll do the meet and greet. I'll shake some hands. I'm going to go over to the fellowship hall right over there. And I'm going to be there as long as we need to be there. And if you have questions, and if you want to unpack Scripture a little bit more, or if you're just kind of confused about, okay, so what does this mean in regards to Scripture, then we'll talk. We will unpack it there. July 19th, I am going to address um, the issue of, what's his name, um, of Bruce Jenner, with the whole changing, you know, from a man to a woman. And you're going to realize it has really nothing to do with that at all. It has everything to do with image of God, image of God and an attack on the character of God. We will talk about that on July 19th, and then we will walk next door, and whoever wants to unpack it deeper, we will, and we'll talk about it. So it could be kind of a Q&A thing, but I will warn you, I will warn you, this is not Facebook, where you get to blah, 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 expecting a couple of thumbs up so you feel good about what you said, okay, and it just lingers. Everything will be talked about in light of this. So I don't want anybody walking away saying, oh, Pastor Edwin, oh, he's so tough, I can't believe. No, 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 no. I said to you many times before, and I'm going to repeat it to you again, Pastor Edwin no longer has an opinion. This is the opinion. This is the opinion. There's a lot of pastors out there who use this as just like a jumping board, a springboard to their own thoughts, their own opinions. Not this one. Not this one. This is the opinion. And the question that I have for you today, and it's funny, it, it, it works in perfectly with what we've been saying. Because now, in light of, the, of what happened this week, I know how my career is going to end. Now I know. Do you know how it's going to end? Can you tell me how it's going to end? I'll tell you how it's going to end. I'm going to be approached, or this church is going to be approached by someone who wants to be married. I will say, no. Why? Because I think so? No, because Scripture says so. They will file a lawsuit against me, discrimination. That's why Tara and myself, and this is a sad thing, I want you to realize the repercussions of what's happening. This is not about people waving cute little flags in front of the Supreme Court. These are very serious repercussions. We need to start paying attention. Okay? So Tara and myself now, my wife, and my children have to separate our bank accounts. Do you know why? Because they're going to come after me. And therefore, I need to protect my two daughters. I need to protect my children. But we will separate that, and obviously I will have, if Tara has away, five dollars to my name. Okay? <laughs> she will have all of it. Okay? Because I want to make sure that my daughters will eat dinner that night while their father is dragged in front of a judge for discrimination. I got an amen in the back, it's good. Do you see this? Do not be surprised, don't be surprised and don't be shocked if in the next seven to 10 to 12 years, you come to this church one morning expecting to hear good worship, expecting to hear, you know, what's pastor gonna say today about the sermon series and the doors are locked. Don't be shocked. And don't be surprised, because I have already received an email from the new organization that we are joining, okay, about now, you know, if seminary wasn't hard enough, okay, learning Greek and Hebrew wasn't bad enough, okay, 
Now I need to learn the law. Now I need to become a lawyer too. And I already have to sit in a seminar so that I understand what has to be said and how it's said and how this church has to present itself. If not, this church will face lawsuits and they will close our doors. It's not cute little flags. It's not cute little stuff we put on Facebook. And just remember this. Remember last week when we were talking about race and all the stuff going on? And I said, when I was young, the old ladies in the church, they said, oh, because if things keep going, remember what I said to you? That day is coming. And what did I say last week? That day is here. Well, guess what? You, and I don't say this in, in, a, in, a, in a light way, so I don't want it to come out that way. I say it because my heart is broken. Because the lady who brought me to Jesus Christ, Miss Fernandez, okay, who passed away recently, used to take me home in the eighth grade because my parents were both working and I, was in, I had to go home alone. And she would tell me as I sat in the seat of her car, it was a Bible study every single day on the way home. And she would tell me, Edwin, I hope that you are not the generation that has to live through what Revelation says about the persecution of Christians. Well, now it breaks my heart to tell you that we are witnessing the beginning of the persecution of Christians in this country. It's not going to be something that you read about, people on the other side of the planet, and it's going to be different. No one here is going to be burned alive. No one here is going to be crucified like, like they're doing on the other side of the world for being a Christian. That's not going to happen. What's going to happen here is when they find out that you are a Christian business owner, when they find out that you're a Christian employee, what do we, back up a week before that, let's see if you remember the sermons. When Paul spoke out to the crowd in the Jerusalem temple, they what? They ran at him from all four corners. That's what's going to happen. So you will have two choices. Do you know what they are? A, you will, like we've been saying, when the spotlight shines on you, you will stand like Paul, like Stephen, who they murdered, like Christ, your Lord and Savior. You will stand your ground and you will say, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, I am a person of this word. Or, or, you can become what, what I'm starting to figure out and I hear it in circles and I see it on the news. And it, basically a social Christian. Let me, let, me, um, let me just define it for you very quickly. Someone who says, oh, I love Jesus, Lord and Savior. That's about it. I don't know what's in here. I don't really care. I like the songs. I like the way pastor speaks. That's about it. And whatever, say, whatever they say goes. You can be one of those. Jesus wasn't one of those. Be careful. Paul wasn't one of those. Peter wasn't one of those. Stephen wasn't one of those. And church, hear me. They paid the price with their lives. So let's just say, let's just, let's just call it what it is. Those of you who know me for a long time, I am not an alarmist. I'm not one of those people who says, oh, no, you know, here we come. But, but it's beginning because you can see it. The last Bible study I did with our college students, they wanted to do Revelation. I'll never do that again. That was crazy. And, uh, oh, man, I'm, my head hurt after every one of those studies. Um, and it's there. It's there. And if you pay attention to what's happening in our country, it's subtle and it's soft, but it's there. And Christianity is slowly being persecuted. It's being pushed and cut and sliced and, and trying to be marginalized. Let me just clarify a few things. Now, I trust that we teach the Bible well enough here. And, and, and hear the whole thing so you understand what I'm about to say. I trust that we teach the Bible well enough here and that we have presented Christ clearly enough here for this church, and I'm not speaking for any other churches, I'm not speaking for any other pastors, I can't do that right now. This is one of those things where I am responsible for you and I am responsible before God, I am held accountable before God 
for presenting this. Do you remember what we said on Father's Day out of Titus chapter 2? So that no one would malign the word of God. Notice that all these things are tying together. Big puzzle coming together. Because it's out there. The social Christians, the ones who just use Jesus as a cliche, as their personal cheerleader who want to just use him to prove their point, are wrong. Let, let me clarify. Jesus would not wave a flag in front of the Supreme Court. How do I know that? This is how I know that. Because when Jesus was approached by a woman caught in adultery, this woman was having sex with a man who was not her husband. They pulled her out of bed, half-dressed. They tossed her in front of Jesus. Do you remember this now? He does what on the ground? He writes something, which we don't know what it is. And when he says, you know, he who does not have sin, finish it for me, throw the first stone, they walk away. Him and the woman have a moment. Woman, where are your accusers? Sir, they've all gone. Finish the sentence for me. What does Jesus say to her as he dismisses her? Go and sin, say it again, no more. Go and sin no more. Christ calls us to holiness because God is a holy God. And God does not justify or bargain with sin. That is why in the Old Testament they killed so many little, beautiful, cute little lambs. Does that make sense to you now? Because the sin was always before God. And Christ hadn't come yet. And so they had to sacrifice animals again and again and shed blood again and again. And this was, this was every single day to cover their sin. God does not negotiate with sin. And, this might shock some of you, God doesn't really care about your opinion. Do we all hear that? He doesn't care about what you write on Facebook. He doesn't care what you think the issues are. He doesn't care what you, th oh, because I heard so-and-so on CNN, or I heard so-and-so on Fox News, I heard so-and-so on this channel, I heard so, they're all talking heads. This is what matters. This is what matters. And so now, we have a very difficult choice to make, you and me, because it, be it begins today, from this moment on. Supreme Court or Bible? What's it going to be? What's it going to be? What's it going to be? The Bible. Supreme Court or the Bible, which one? Because it's gonna, it's, they're, they're going to knock on your door. The conversations are going to come to you. We've been talking about standing up for Christ, standing up in the workplace, sharing Jesus. Guess what? Now the first question that's going to come out at you when, when, when you start sharing Jesus with someone in the workplace, hey, what about that same marriage thing? What are you going to say? Supreme Court? Or are you going to talk about the Bible? Which one? You see? You see how it becomes very real all of a sudden? How all of a sudden church is just not an exercise. How this is just, not just fun in front of God. Playground on Sundays before the Lord. Let's celebrate. Yeah, we do celebrate. Not a playground. If I was an African American, I would be livid. Livid. That they are comparing this to the struggle for civil rights. The fact that I heard that on the news, I'm a history buff. Those of you who know me, I'm a history buff. I love timelines, I love events, I love people, biographies. I know them all. Be careful when you talk history with me. You gotta be careful. Because I have one of those, I'll recall the information right now. Not as fast as Dr. Swain and some of those guys up there because they're like uber geniuses. Okay, I'm not even in their neighborhood. But I, I'm, I do pretty well. And it is shocking that that is being compared. Let me tell you why it's different. So that if someone in your life brings it up, you will know what to say. I've sat in his church several times there in Atlanta. Have you been able to go to Dr. King's church? Please go. Please go. Go to the museum. 
across the street and then sit in the church right now, they have a lot of his sermons playing. And you can sit in this old church. It smells like old church. Oh, it's a great smell. So good. And if you close your eyes, it's like if he was there. And he was fighting against a systematic sin. Does that make sense? It was sin in a system. And he was trying to tear down a system, okay, that was trying to uphold sin, holding someone under you, making someone less than. This is different. This is legitimizing sin. This is saying that sin is okay. This is saying, sure, you want to do that? Go for it. That's not the word of Scripture. And I would be, I am beside myself that people have gone as far as to compare what happened in the 60s and 70s in this country, which, as we talked about on Father's Day, is not over. That's why a young white man walks into a black church and kills seven people in a Bible study. It's still there. Still haven't healed. We still haven't figured it out because we haven't brought Christ into it profoundly. But then there are people saying, oh, it's the same thing. No, it's not the same thing. Dr. King was trying to destroy sin, not uphold it. He was trying to tear down sin, not celebrate it. It's different. It's different. Don't fall for that ridiculous argument. Don't fall for that ridiculous comparison. We as Christians have to be smarter than that. You've got to be able to see the angle and the logic with which with the arguments are trying to be made. So, that's just to clarify, just to kind of begin the conversation in your mind. And when we come back to this on July 12th, and I think I'll come back to it again, because we're talking about the whole persecution angle, and that's, that's very real and present now. Okay? And I think I'll come back to this at, at the end of the message. It's a, it's a very short message. I knew that this intro, I didn't know where it was going to go, but I just had to say some of these things to you. So we clarified, and we're on the same page. Okay? We are living in a moment in time where we are going to be called to stand for Christ as no generation has had to stand for Him before. And I was, I was so frustrated with our president who sends out this little message. You know, and you've heard me say before, whether you agree with presidents or not, God moves rulers on and off the world stage and he commands us, 1 Timothy chapter 2, Romans 12, uh, and a couple of other passages to lift them up in prayer no matter what. But I was very frustrated and very hurt that people are, you know, this hashtag love wins. No, no, no. Love did not win this week. Sin won this week. Let's make sure we, let's make sure we get our stuff straight. So I'm just trying to be, I'm tonight, today I'm just beginning just to give you like a corrective and to give you some categories so, because you're going to begin to encounter people who say, oh, you go to church? What do you think about that? Well, you know, we, we got to know what it's about. And when we talk on July 12th, about marriage proper, what you are going to realize is that when you look at God's word, it's a closed argument. There's no wiggle room there. There's, there's, there's no wiggle room. There's none. And we'll walk through that and we'll see it. Now, church, hear what I'm about to say. And this, this, this will kind of come into the sermon. Raul, can you put it up already? Thank you. Um, as we begin to engage our culture in this manner, as we begin to continue to share Christ and see, no, you can put the points up. Thank you, Raul. We'll, we'll close with that. Um, as we begin to engage, you need to understand something, though. There is this radical element, uh, human beings in the end, radical element within the church who wants to say, oh, that is bad. 
We hate those people. That is not biblical. That is not biblical. Okay? What is biblical is what Jesus, the encounter with this woman, go and sin no more. So let me ask you a question. If all of you knew that I had a woman on the side, I'm pastor, two daughters, my wife is a worship leader. If all of you knew that I had a woman on the side, what would you say to me? What would you do as a church? Would you A, call me, pastor, sit down, we need to talk. There is sin here, it needs to be confessed, and you need to repent. What does repent, repentance mean? Turn, right, and walk away. Or, or, would you as a church sit down, whisper amongst each other and say, we're going to pass a rule that it's okay for our pastor to have a wife and a girlfriend. Which one would you do? Right? Simple? Guess what's being done? Do you see it? Guess what's being done? Sin is being legitimized. So, as we deal with individuals that come to us and say, well, but, you know, but, say, listen, I love you, and so does the Lord, but he's asking that this is not his way. God instituted the structure himself. Where did the first wedding take place? Where did the first wedding take place? Garden of Eden. Who was the pastor? God was the pastor. Do you think it's important to him? Do you see how quickly all the noise falls apart when you just run it through the filter of this? But brothers and sisters, it's going to get difficult. It's going to get difficult. And I'm just going to tell you that the, the one who is going to suffer and take the first shots of this is standing in front of you. And it's going to, this building right here. And it's going to happen. Because it's begun. So, we need to pray deeply and honestly, fervently. We need to dig into the Word. We need to jump in into the Word. And it is so incredible how God does, I mean, just how this, because the, the Bible study that we have ready for the fall is by David Platt. Those, some of you did the Platt study this spring. And it's called counterculture. You know, it's standing in the culture against the culture. Loving it to Christ, not just kind of giving into it, but standing strong and saying, I am with you. I share space, but I don't completely agree with you. And I love you. And here's the word. And so it's just going to be an amazing Bible study. That's starting up at the end of August. You don't have to stand today. Just, just stay right there. Uh, Acts chapter 23, verses 1 through 11. Let me read it to you, and then we'll just unpack very quickly, and it'll all kind of come together. I'll, I'll pull the strands together. Word of God. Paul looks straight at the Sanhedrin. Remember, last, you know, he was assaulted, accused. The Roman soldier guy had to come and save him out. They had to surround him, chain him. He talked to the crowd, okay? He was pulled aside. Now the Sanhedrin comes in, and now the, the commander takes him there. So we're still in the temple courts. We're having this conversation, and here's where we are. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God and in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. He didn't care about making friends. You sit there to judge me according to the law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. You couldn't slap somebody unless they were found guilty. Those who were standing near Paul said, you dare to insult God's high priest? Paul replied, brothers, I did not realize that he was the high priest, for it is written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Paul always quick with the Bible. Exodus 22. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, my brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection, and that there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledged them all. There was a great uproar, 
And some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man. Now he's innocent. This, he's, they were trying to kill him. Now he's innocent. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? The dispute became so violent that the commander was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. The second time he's almost torn to pieces in less than a couple of hours. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. Listen, church, listen. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified, testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Very quickly, let's, let me just tie a couple of things together and we'll tie with the way the conversation started. Paul shows you that he's human. As you engage people, as you start to have some of these conversations, especially in light of this week and in light of last, uh, last week, there'll be some misunderstandings, there'll be some tense moments. Notice that Paul was human in the end. He lost his cool. Okay, it says that he was looking intently at the Sanhedrin. That word intently is the same word that's used in Acts chapter 1 when the disciples are looking intently at Jesus ascending. You know, a fixed gaze, completely concentrated on, like, has that happened to you where everything else disappears and you just see one thing? That, that's what's happening. You know, you got, so you got this, think about it, Paul was a murderer of Christians and so that kind of anger and that kind of passion still burns in there. It was redirected by Christ. So now he's facing the same guys who told him to go kill Christians. Now he's on the other side of the fence. But that anger still burns. That, that passion is still there. So he kind of, you know, there, everything just kind of blurs out. And it's just, you know, he's just focusing in on these guys. He looked intently at them. But then notice Paul. He's giving us advice of how to have the difficult conversations. How to, what's the first thing he says to them? Brothers. In other words, I am not Mr. Christian or Mrs. Christian standing over you. I am not Mr. or Mrs. Christian who knows more than you. Brothers, sisters, I'm a broken sinner just like you. That is your issue? I have 15. Brothers, sisters, we share that sinful space. The only difference is that I have repented. I have confessed my sin, accepted Christ, and I am being redeemed. And I want you to have the same experience. We learned that from Paul. And what I've been trying to do all these weeks is to give you different scenarios of how to share and the why and the strategy, these little pointers that, that he gives us as he does this. When you insult the high priest of Israel, you get slapped across the face. And that's when he, then he really just explodes. Hypocrites, whitewashed walls. I spent a lot of my time when I was younger and I was more immature and my temper had the best of me. And so I was theologically strong with a, with a big mouth. And I spent too much of my time as a gladiator for Jesus instead of an ambassador for Jesus. Does that make sense? There are moments when you pull out the sword, okay, you know, the word of God, and it says what it says, it is what it is, and you don't back down, but those moments are few and far between. And being an ambassador of Christ is more of, show me how you live and I will listen to you. Gladiators kill their opponent. They don't sit down and have a conversation with them. I destroyed too many conversations. My fault. And my prayer is that God would redeem and just use the little bits and pieces of truth that were in those conversations. Because I was more like Paul on, on this day, angry, focused, not minding what I was saying. He sounds a warning to us, though, whitewashed walls. It's funny because Jesus used the same phrase, and I just want to throw it out today so that we wrestle with it, too. The Jews would paint their tombs white so that people would see them clearly and not touch them so that they wouldn't become defiled. 
the point was, don't look like a Christian. Bright, shiny. And he called the high priest that. Don't just know the verses. Don't just know the songs. Don't just do church. Don't just have the conversations. Don't just be on the outside. And on the inside, there's death and decay and darkness and emptiness. It don't work. And there's too many Christians who extend a fake hand of fellowship. There are too many Christians who extend a fake smile of fellowship. There's too many Christians who look you in the eye and then turn around and stab you in the back. Whitewashed wall. Church, we've arrived at a point where we can't afford that anymore. We've got to be transparent and true. And if they slap you on the face turn the other cheek for the sake of their salvation. For the sake of their salvation. And don't allow pride to get in the way. Don't justify wrong actions. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. Pride kills the ability to give Christ to someone else. And I did that too much. And I don't want the same thing to happen with you with the people that God has brought into your life to change them for salvation. If they insult you and they attack you and they accuse you, turn the other cheek. Don't allow anger to get the best of you. Don't lose your cool. You want them saved for eternity. It's okay to swallow it. Better to take a slap in the face now and share eternity with them. Paul apologized, humble. I did not realize. The Bible says. Apologies and humility sometimes go much, much further than a lot of Bible information to impact someone for salvation. And then hope. And now we come back around to the issue that's happening in our society with us. Raul, can you give me the, the funny looking composer? I want to make sure I say it right. Paderewski or Paderewski. Polish piano composer, concert pianist. Actually was a politician for a while as well. He's here in the United States. If I remember correctly, born in 1860, died in 1941. And uh, he's here in the United States. He's touring a little bit. Concert hall is, the concert hall is full of people. Piano's up on stage by itself. Black, glistening, it's got the little spotlight on it. Nine-year-old kid with his mom hates being there. Doesn't want to be there. And so concert taking long to start, and you know, you know how kids get fidgety, right? Fidgety, fidgety. And so the mom you know, just relax, and stop, and just don't move anymore. And, you know, I wish there was a seatbelt and you know all that stuff. And um, mom turns to talk to a friend. Nine-year-old walks away. And uh, about two minutes later, she's engaged, and it's kind of loud. The concert hall's waiting. A lot of noise. Two minutes later, you hear, and I never knew the name of this song, Chopsticks. Does that mean anything to anyone? I know we've got some music folks. Is it now? Hall goes quiet. They thought it was him. It wasn't him. It's the nine-year-old. He's on stage. He sat down at the little chair thing. Where's, oh, we used to have a piano there. It's gone now. Okay? Sat down, and he's playing. The master hears, who's playing my piano? What's going on? I'm, I'm. He puts on his, his coat, his tux. He goes out there, stands behind a little guy. Just looking at him. And everyone's waiting. What is he going to do? Sits down next to the boy and starts to play with him. And he starts to do the melody. I think in music circles, maybe the counter melody to the. And now they're playing together. 
And you know what he kept whispering to the boy? Don't stop. Don't quit. Keep playing. Don't look at them. Keep going. Keep going the whole way through. And now the concert started with the nine-year-old and the master. Paul was sitting in jail at the end of these encounters. He was tired. He was beat up. Three journeys through the Roman Empire where he was beaten, stoned, jailed. He showed up to Jerusalem with an offering. The Jerusalem church is like, well, yeah, but you got to do this. People are worried about you. And now he's been attacked twice, almost torn to pieces. He addressed a crowd. Roman soldiers pull him out. He addressed a Sanhedrin. They slap him in the face. And he is sitting in a jail cell by himself that night. And he is tired. And he is frustrated. And he is bruised. And he feels empty. What does Christ do when we arrive at that place? The scripture says that he stood near. Courage. Some of your Bibles might have translated it, take heart or have courage. It's just one word in the Greek. Courage. The Bible translators always translate it as take heart. Jesus is the only one who uses that phrase in the entire New Testament. He uses it five times. And every time it's take heart, take heart, take heart. Let's connect now. In light of the events of the last two weeks, You're going to be challenged. You are going to be, some of you who are more bold than others or a little more sharp with your sharing, you're going to be attacked and accused. Some of you might lose your job for standing for Jesus. Some of you might lose your business in light of the climate that is being born in this country. Jesus stands near you day. Jesus will stand next to you on that day. And when you look at the language underneath the standing near, it was almost as if Jesus walked up and just went like this to Paul. Hand on the shoulder. You're not alone. Keep going. Keep sharing. Keep loving Keep getting into my word. Do not back down. So church, I say to you that from this week onward, it will only become more and more difficult to do what we do, to live how Christ has called us to live. To that, I say to you, take heart. Take heart. Have courage. Do not Stop living for Christ. Do not stop standing for his word. Do not, do not, and do not. Have courage. Be strong. Don't get up from the piano. Keep playing the melody that God has called you to play. If you have any questions for me after the service, feel free to ask them. We can start the dialogue today. July 12th. We will talk about marriage, July 19th. We will talk about image of God. And we will do debrief afterwards, and we will unpack. And I want to make sure that you as a Christian and you as a believer, as you stand and share, which is what been what this series is about, which there were three more messages left. We're closing it today. That you will be prepared to answer and engage a society that is confused and bewildered and kind of lost and we are the ones who can bring direction and clarity to the whole thing. It falls on us. It falls on us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with heavy hearts because your heart is broken when sin is celebrated. Your heart is saddened. When the humanity that you're trying to save revels in their sin. Father, these issues are not new. Paul dealt with this in the Roman church. Israel 
dealt with this in the Old Testament as she made her way to the promised land, Lord. Sin always shows itself, Father. Different ways, different forms in every generation. Father, it is becoming more and more apparent that you are bringing us to a turning point. I pray, God, that you would give us eyes to see what you're doing, eyes to know direction. Lord, give us your words to respond and to speak. But Lord, we as Christians, better said, followers of your son, Jesus Christ, radically aligned with him, radically aligned with your word. Father, we will stand for your truth. Our country, countries around the world can pass whatever kind of laws they want. The only law that matters to us is the law of your word. And that is what we will live by. And that is what we will uphold. That is what we will celebrate and delight in. And that is what we will revere in as well. Father, every man and woman in Scripture that you call to stand for you and your truth and your word paid a dear price. I pray, God, that you would find us prepared to pay that price. We will not apologize for your word. We will not cut and paste it. We will play on with you next to us, hand on our shoulder, as we hear you tell us, have courage, take heart, you are not alone. So Father, this morning, we lift you up. We lift you up above all opinions, above all laws. We just want you, Lord, to reign over us to reign over this land. We pray for good conversations. Not arguments, conversations. Truth and love, your word says. But truth. Give us the opportunity to give people that choice of engaging your son, of coming back home of delighting in your word, changing someone's eternal destiny. Give us those opportunities, God, in light of what's happened these last two weeks in our country. Father, this church will stand for you and your word. The leadership of this church will stand for you and your word. The pastors of this church will stand for you and your word, no matter the cost no matter the cost. Because when our lives were on the line, you didn't count the cost. You sent your son to die for us. The ultimate sacrifice, Lord. And Father, in different ways, we will offer up our sacrifice to you. Help us, Lord. These are difficult moments that we navigate and live through. But we are not alone. You have come close. You have stood next to us. And Lord, this morning, I pray that we would hear you. Have courage. Take heart. We are not alone. Thank you, Lord. We love you. Thank you for loving us in your son. In Jesus' name, we all pray. Amen. 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 The Lord bless you. This is the moment in our service where we collect our tithes and our offerings. We always ask you to give as the Lord leads you to give, knowing that he has given us everything. And so if you're visiting with us today, we're glad that you're here. We thank you for being here. We hope that you, will, that you felt comfortable in our midst, here in our family of faith. If you could take a moment to fill out the communication cards in front of you. Uh, we just want to stay in touch with you. We sent out a weekly newsletter. If the offering plate comes by a little too quickly, there are some on the table out in the lobby. Having said that, Antoine and Danny will collect the morning offering.
to thirst for your presence If I'd never known that place How could I have known you were better? So a couple announcements for us this morning. The first is the United Service. So next Sunday, 11 a.m. will be our service together with our Spanish service. It's always a very powerful service. I love the service because you really can't um, find it anywhere else. And so it's really powerful to see um, just us getting to worship together and, um, and to be together uh, united with our Spanish service. So next Sunday at 11 a.m., uh, we'll be meeting uh, with the Spanish service. And then afterwards, there'll be pastelitos and desserts and stuff next door, so uh, 4th of July weekend, uh, 
hopefully you'll be here for that. And then two weeks away is our Daytona Beach Camp for the middle schoolers and high schoolers. Um, so as of right now, our spots are full for that. And if you are still interested and want to be put onto a waiting list, um, you can see me if you are still interested in signing up for that, and we'll see if we can add some spots. Um, but that is coming up two weeks away. Make sure you get your final payment, which is due to me this weekend. And then also, if you uh, the forms, um, you can bring those, uh, start bringing those in as well. If you need yours notarized, come see me in the back today. We can get it notarized today. Uh, and uh, the next announcement is our um, our uh, live stream and our podcast of all of our sermons. So you can go onto our website, RedeemerChurchMiami.com. Or, uh, or Well, it's the same technically, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So either way, it should connect. Uh, Redeemer Church Miami, and then hit media and podcast. And you can download the sermons. You can put them on your phone or any, your tablet or any device. And you can also go onto YouTube and see our full services on YouTube uh, as well through any device. So if you're on your way to work, and you want to uh, either watch a sermon that you missed or watch a sermon that really stood out to you. If you want to share it with someone, you can send them the link to that. So you can see all of our services on our YouTube page. Just search Redeemer Church Miami on YouTube. And then the next announcement, I'll pass it over to Pastor Edward. Campaign is done. I just want to kind of update you on stuff. Uh, we are waiting for the lawyers are still haggling over one another. That's why Ricky mentioned that. It'll be a united service. We're not sure if we're transitioning yet or not. Uh, they're fighting over some language. What we have done is uh, what we promised. We've begun to take the extra funds that were raised, and there are uh, new water fountains with a third one on the way for the little kids. Uh, the whole face of the fellowship hall has been replaced. The, the roof was uh, completely destroyed. There is a brand new door over on the far side of the fellowship hall, which was just disappearing. Uh, the architect is already designing baby room and new sound booth new kitchen uh and you know we're starting to talk about how to do the bathrooms and redoing the offices and we'll get to the preschool towards the end of the summer so i just want you to understand that you know all the the money that was fundraised we're doing exactly what we promised we would do uh half a million was set aside for the exit fee the other monies are already being invested in the property slowly you see some of the patchwork happening around we can't make any big moves until the agreement is finalized in case something happens uh, you know, with they want more or, let, you know, so we're just doing the small things to set up for the big stuff. But I just want you to be aware. I want to update you with that stuff is starting little by little. And we're keeping our promise uh, as we told you what we will do with the funding. So having said that, let's stand together. Uh, let's join hands across the way. Uh, please be in prayer for your brothers and sisters in church this week. Please be in prayer for this church. Uh, be in prayer for Christians around our country and for uh, Christians around the world. Um, as just situations are very difficult. So let's support one another in prayer uh, and send somebody an encouraging text this week. Uh, let them know that you're praying for them, that you love them. Uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we thank you for giving us uh, the riches of your salvation in your son, Jesus Christ. We celebrate him this morning. We stand for him this morning because when it counted and when it was needed, he stood for us on a cross, broken and bloody so that we might be free from sin and from death, once and for all. And Father, because of that sacrifice, Lord, we go forth with your word. We go forth with the truth. We will stand strong for you because we know that you go with us. We know that we stand in your presence. We know that we are in your presence, Father. Today we take heart. We have courage, Lord, because of what you've done for us. So Heavenly Father, we give you all the glory. We love your Son, and we ask that the Holy Spirit will continue to work in us and through us that we might be your ambassadors to our friends, our families, and our schools, and our jobs, and our community, Lord, in this city, Father, that we would bring her back to you. So, Father, we love you. Thank you for loving us in Jesus Christ. May our honor, glory, and blessing always be to the blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let's worship together. This dry and desert land, I tell myself, keep walking on. Here's something up ahead, water falling like a song. An everlasting stream, your river can. 